let's talk about optimization. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Start with. So let's look at this example. My pens, my pens. The rectangular, let's put that be done. Box with a square. Yeah, I can just pen it in. Let's see back. With a square base and no top is to be constructed. With 108 square inches of material. Maybe it's metal, maybe it's cardboard, who knows? What dimensions will minimize, sorry, maximize, apologies. I'm trying to make a box small. What dimensions will maximize the volume of the box? So, there's kind of a process for doing optimization problems. Uh, it's kind of similar-ish to when we did related rates in that you kind of draw a picture, you find out what's changing, you, you, know, you write an equation, you differentiate both sides. It's different in that here we're gonna be thinking about what we wanna maximize or minimize, finding a constraint um, and doing a couple of things, but the, it's very kind of similar-ish steps. So if you remember how Related rates, related rates went. This isn't super different. I mean, it is different, but like the process is similar. So, first, draw a picture. If it makes sense to draw a picture. Thanks. And it does here. So, here's my box with a square base. I just want to label it. And it's got an open top. So it looks kind of like that. Um, I'm going to call the base sides x, and they're each x because it's a square base. Right, I don't want to use extra variables, so I don't have to. And let's call the height. You can call it y, you can call it h, I'm going to pick y. So there's my box. And the thing I'm trying to do that you maximize, I want to maximize the volume which is base times depth times height, or base area times height. Now be careful. It's really easy to be like, oh, I'm going to set that equal to 108, because 108 is in there. That's not the case, right? We're trying to maximize the volume. We don't actually know what it is. It wouldn't make sense to say it's 108 if we're trying to maximize it. We'd be done with the question before we even started. The 108 comes up in our constraint. So our constraint is that we have 108 square inches of material to work with. Well, when someone says you have this much material to work with, they're talking about surface area. So the surface area is the amount of material. So our surface area, well, when it's a nice rectangular thing or a square thing, you just add up all the areas of the size, which means you just have to find a bunch of rectangular areas. The bottom is going to be x squared. If I, so if you want, we can make this picture more obvious of what's going on here. Right, there's the behind the scenes part of the box. The bottom part is x squared. And then each of the four sides is an x times a y. I'm going to have xy plus xy plus xy plus xy. That's going to be four xy's. And we're going to use all of the materials because we're trying to make this thing as big as possible. So we're going to set that equal to 100. That's our constraint. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use that constraint to isolate a variable. Most of the time, it's either not going to matter which one you choose because it's going to be kind of the same, or it's going to be really obvious which one is easier to solve for. Here, it's much easier to solve for y than it is to solve for x. Welcome. Can I see your symptom survey, please? Um, so we're going to solve for y here because there's only one y and there's multiple x's. So 4xy equals 108 minus x squared. y equals 108 over 4x minus x squared over 4x. Um, yeah, the, you can just write it too much. all over 4x either way. You can also simplify this as 
27 over x. Thank you. Thank you. Minus x over 4. And now, the whole reason we did this, and I should maybe back up a little bit, the whole reason we did this is because the thing we're trying to maximize is a function of two variables. And at least in 17a, not true in 17c, but in 17a, we can only really maximize functions of one variable. In 17c, you will learn how to maximize functions of two variables. It's kind of neat. But in this class, we this is a problem for us. So we're going to try and just write this function as a function of one variable, which is why we're using this constraint to do that. So now we want to maximize. Um, the volume as a function of x, which is x squared times y. Plug it in for y there. And although we could use the product rule, let's make our lives easier and multiply this out before we do any differentiating. So I'm going to write the volume as a function of x. X squared times 27 over X is going to be 27 X. X squared times X over four is going to be one fourth X cubed or X cubed over four, either way. And now we finally get to actually use calculus, right? All this so far has been set up. Now we're actually going to take a derivative because that's how we typically optimize things or find where we have a maximum by finding where the derivative is zero or undefined. So my derivative here, is going to be 27 minus 3 fourths x squared. I'm going to set that equal to zero. So let's see, solving for x, I'm going to get 27 equal to 3 fourths x squared. And multiply both sides by 4 thirds. I get 4 thirds times 27 equals x squared. But that's 36. So x squared equals 36. And x is, so the solutions are plus or minus six, but some of those solutions don't make sense. Right? It doesn't make sense for the side of a box to be a negative length. So you could write plus or minus six, but really we should just say it's going to be plus six because it doesn't make sense for it to be minus six. Um, now, a couple things here. Sometimes people are really invested in you checking to make sure that the answer actually is what kind of thing you have. Meaning they said find a maximum. So it's probably pretty likely that x equals six is gonna maximize the volume. But we don't actually know that. And maybe it's actually giving us a minimum or maybe it's neither. So sometimes on tests, obviously they can't really make you check on the homework because like, how would you show that work? But the way you would check to see, is this actually a maximum? is by using the first derivative test. So on my number line here, there's my critical value of six. Here's my derivative. And I want to see when you plug in something bigger than six, is this derivative positive or negative? Well, here's my derivative. If I pick something bigger than six, let's make it easy. Pick something really big, like 10. If x is 10, 27 minus 3 fourths times 100, that's definitely going to be negative. It might be easier if you, I don't know, you can't really factor that at all. If you plug in 10 here, very, very obviously, the derivative is negative. I mean, not very obviously. With a little bit of work, we can see that the derivative is negative if you plug in 10. Now, over here, I've made it look like you can pick anything, but really, we're limited because x should be non negative. Right? It doesn't make sense for x to be negative. It really doesn't probably make sense for x to be zero either. We should kind of cut this off at zero. And we should pick something that's between zero and six, like one. I would pick one. If you plug in one to the derivative, you're going to get 27, sorry, 27 minus three fourths. That's definitely positive. So, oh, yeah, my function is increasing before six, it is decreasing after six. We definitely have a maximum volume when x equals six, six inches. We're not quite done. So the problem said, what dimensions will maximize the volume? We found x, but if we look back at our picture, there was an x and a y. 
and we should also find what the y value is. Luckily, we already have an equation for y right here. I want to find the y value. Y is going to be 27 divided by x minus x divided by 4. That looks pretty gross. It might have been better if we hadn't simplified this in this way. But if we do this, it's not so bad. 27 over 6 reduces to uh, 9 over 2. And 6 over 4 reduces to 3 over 2. And you get 6 over 2, which is 3. So y is going to be 3 inches. I'm sorry, I can't do that. So I know there's quite a few steps here, but this is kind of the process. Draw a picture, write the equation of the thing you want to optimize, um, find a constraint, solve for a variable, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, test to see if it's the maximum or minimum, and then find the other dimension that you're asking. Questions about this problem? Yeah. The x squared plus 4xy the surface area. The x plus 4xy is the surface area, yeah. We use that to solve for one variable, then plug it into the volume. Correct. And, that, and so typically, you're going to use your constraint. In this case, we are constrained by the fact that we only have 108 square inches of material to use. You're going to solve, you're going to use your constraint to isolate a variable and then point that back into the thing you want to optimize. How do you know it's surface area? Well, that's a good question. So if they say we have this much material to use, they always they do mean surface area by that. Like that's just a, it's a standard kind of math language thing. When they say surface area, they're trying to be like talking about real world stuff. And so they're like, oh, we'll say you know material instead of saying the surface area. But the real kind of clue is that they've talked about that we're constrained by having 108 square inches of material. And once you see that square inches, you're like, oh well, it's got to be area. In this case, the only kind of area that makes sense to talk about is the surface area. That is on another hand over here somewhere. Oh, so we have to like test to see the maximum quantity. Well, I don't know about half to. Okay. I usually do because that's the way I learned how to do it and we definitely had to on exams show that I had a maximum or a minimum. But you probably don't need to on your homework, but you might need to on the test. I would I'd like to think your teacher would let you know if they wanted you to do that or not. Um, most of the time, if you're asked to maximize a thing, the thing you're finding will actually maximize, but not guaranteed. So let's look at a couple other things. Yeah. Well, let's say we have a. Uh, actually, yeah, I want to look at this other problem here. Let me, take a Let me take a look at this real quick here. There's one I have that, yeah, that's kind of gross, but it's not that gross. I think this is, yeah. So this is a, a textbook problem. I think it also is popping up in some of your guys' homework assignments. So let's look at this one. It's number 28 from section 4.4. And here's how it goes. The energy expended by a fish swimming at a speed of V against a current of speed U is given by energy of V is A times V cubed times L over V minus U, where L is the length of swim constant. All we really care about is the fact that that's a constant. And V minus U is also, or U is also a constant. Right, U is the speed of the current. And V should be positive. So the question we're going to answer is what speed minimizes the energy expended?
Well, there's some good news here. Half of the battle is already done. They've given us the equation for the thing we're trying to minimize. There's no constraint we have to deal with. There's no plugging into the other thing. We're just like, here's the thing, minimize that. All right. So we're going to minimize the way we typically do by taking a derivative and setting it equal to zero, finding the critical value. So let's see here. Oh, okay, I would probably rewrite this as sounds very loud over there. Um, a times L times V cubed over V minus C. And while you could put that A times L out in front, I don't think it really makes a difference one way or the other. I mean, it's not like a big difference. So let's see what we've got. The derivative. So let's see, it's going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top, which is going to be a times L times 3V squared minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is one all over the bottom squared. That looks kind of dark. Let me frame that a little bit. And we're going to set this equal to zero. So trying to find the critical values. I guess we should also consider where it's undefined, right? Well, we'll see about that in a minute. So let's see here. I need to simplify this. Uh, this looks kind of not super fun. So let's distribute this out and get, um, yeah, we should distribute this through these. And we're going to get A times L times 3V cubed minus A times L times 3V squared U minus a times l times v cubed all over v minus u squared. We probably might have been better off factoring out the a times l in the beginning, but we didn't. But let's see what we can factor out. We can factor out an a, l, and uh, v squared. We do that, we're left with a 3v and 3u and a minus v all over v minus u squared. And finally, simplifying that, we've got a times l times v squared times 2v minus 3u all over v minus u squared. OK, so we want this to equal 0. There's a couple solutions. Oh, question, sorry. Well, because V is the variable of interest and U is a constant. U is the speed of the river or body of water that they're swimming through. And we're making the assumption that it's constant to the problem. So let's see. Either, so I'm going to set the top equal to zero because, like, that's what I would do. We set A times L times V squared times 2V minus 3U equal to zero. We're either going to get V equal to zero, which isn't great or we're going to get 2v minus 3u equal to 0, which is going to give us v equal to positive 3 halves u. Oops, sorry. And I guess we also might point out that technically, well, actually, I should ask you all, is v equal to u a critical value? Well, it's tricky. It, I would say it's what I call a pseudo critical value because V equal to U definitely makes the derivative undefined. But if we look back at the original function, is V equal to U in the domain? No, it's not. If V was equal to U, how much energy would we have to expend? Um, something like an infinite amount which we probably don't have. So it's important to, so, and this is something that kind of is, is like a tiny kind of part, but whenever you're talking about critical values, technically they should be in the domain of the original function. So V equals U is actually not a critical value. Even though we would still think about it being on our number line if we were graphing stuff, or we would think about it when we do this problem here. 
All right, so now I want to see, does this actually minimize the amount of energy we're going to expend? Well, let's see here. So I've got um, zero, and then U, which is probably, probably or problematic, not problematic, problematic. Right? That would be where we have a vertical asymptote. And then we've also got three halves U, which is definitely bigger than U. So this is kind of, so even though U isn't a legit critical value, it's still really important to include on your number line. Let me show you why. Um, uh, actually, it's probably not super important here, but it's still important. So if we look back at our derivative here, And I'm looking at the factor form because it's going to be easiest to deal with. I want to see what's happening. My hope is that this is a minimum, meaning it should be decreasing before, increasing after. So I'm going to test points that are on either side of this. So what's something that's bigger than three halves u? So this is a problem that we encounter a lot in this class because like you're given stuff in terms of constants, right? And you're like, what's bigger than k? Well, 2k if k is positive. So if you know your constant is positive, which you should be positive, then you can just pick a higher multiple of it. So I'm going to pick, I'm going to try plugging in 2u. If I plug in 2u to this expression up here, I get a times l times v squared, which is all positive, right? A, l, a and l are positive, which I didn't say. That's positive. And if V is 2U, I'm going to have 4U minus 3U, which is positive. And then the bottom is going to be positive. All right, we're on track so far. Now we have to pick something in here. Well, a couple of ways you could go. You could say, well, I'm just going to say that 3 halves U came from this factor, which has an odd power, so the sign should change. But if you didn't want to do it that way, you could, well, I'm going to pick something between u and one and a half u, I'm going to pick five fourths u. I mean, right, it's between them. So then a times l is positive, five fourths u squared is positive, and two times five fourths, let's see, two times five fourths u minus three u, that's going to be 10 fourths, which is 2.5 u minus three u. That's definitely going to be negative. And then bottom's positive. So it is definitely negative in there. It would also be negative over here, but the, so what I wanted to say, what, I, what this example doesn't really show, but if we aren't careful and you pick something that's like too far to the left, you might accidentally see that the sign isn't changing when it should be. So just be careful and recognize kind of all of your possible critical values in quotes. So this speed that is one and a half times the current speed, that's going to minimize the energy expended. Which is kind of neat to think about if it's actually true. Like, I don't really, like, I have no idea about the formula for real. Like, it's just some formula that's in the book. Okay, neat. But if that's really kind of true, it's, it's interesting, I think, that, oh, if you swim faster than that, it's going to take more energy. And if you swim slower than that, it's going to take more energy because the current is kind of pushing you back a lot. I mean, I don't really have a good idea of why that's the way it is, but it's interesting. All right, let's, what time is it? Okay, let's look at some more examples. This class is kind of neat, unlike other classes, and a lot of the examples are biological. Most of the other classes, when we talk about optimization, they're pretty much physical object examples, like volume of a thing or area of a thing. Um, which are still a lot of the examples. So let's look at this next one. Um, ooh, this. A closed circular cylinder, or just a cylinder. Closed meaning it doesn't have an open top. Is going to hold, or needs to hold, two liters. I'll talk about that in a second. 
what dimensions will minimize the cost to produce these cylinders. And we could say in mass quantities, but it doesn't really matter the cost of one is the cost of one. So in large quantities. Okay, well, a couple of things here. Liters is not helpful if we're talking about trying to find the dimensions of this, of this thing. And we need to know that one liter typically, if you're talking about like water at some specific temperature with some certain atmospheres, the idea is that one liter is a thousand cubic centimeters. So our thing is going to hold 2,000 cubic centimeters. So our volume needs to be 2,000 cubic centimeters. And that's our constraint. I know I'm getting ahead of myself there. That's our constraint. And if we're minimizing cost, what are we really talking about minimizing? Surface area, right? Because we're minimizing the amount of material that we're using, which is affecting the cost. So we're really going to minimize, minimizing cost means minimize surface area. Now, sometimes, not in this problem, but sometimes they will say that different sides of the thing cost different amounts. And then we, just, in fact, no, I don't want, this problem's already good the way it is, but we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. All right, so I always like to write the thing I'm going to minimize that's just kind of how I'm used to doing it, but I suppose we could do this since we've already got it here. Here's my cylinder. And most shapes that we encounter, with one exception that I'll talk about next, we should have an idea of what the surface area and volume equations are. We should definitely know that the volume of a cylinder is the base area times the height. I'm calling this the height, and this is the radius. There's the volume of our cylinder. And we want that to equal 2,000. OK, so now we're trying to minimize the surface area. And the surface area, well, when I think about a cylinder, it's not always easy to remember what the surface area formula is. Um, I'm going to think about it. it's got two circles, a top and a bottom, unless it's an open cylinder right, where you don't have a top, like a cup, like someone said they're building a cup. They would mean that you didn't have a top of the cylinder. So that's going to be two times pi r squared. And then the around part of the cylinder, I always imagine it like this. The around part, well, think about a roll of paper towels. If you unroll one of those paper towels, it's going to look like what kind of shape? A rectangle. I mean, usually paper towels are more squarish, but like maybe you would like you got the select the size ones, which would be like three paper towels all the way around, three of the half ones. Yeah, okay. So it's not actually a square, it's a rectangle. And the height of that square, sorry, rectangle is still the height. And how long is that rectangle? Well, it went all the way around the circle, so it's going to be the exactly the circumference, which is two pi r. So the area of the around part of a cylinder is 2 pi r times h. There's kind of a nice symmetry there, right? It's 2 pi r times r plus 2 pi r times h. It's not too terrible. You could factor out the 2 pi r if you really wanted to, but I never would do that. We're trying to minimize this. Here's our constraint. In my constraint equation, does it make more sense to solve for H or for R? Definitely H, right? I don't want to square root both sides if I don't need to. Now, I will mention as a quick aside, occasionally, this is like, there's like one question where you're trying to like inscribe a cone in a sphere. That's a weird question. But in that equation, the thing you're trying to maximize only has R squared in it. And so when you try and solve for your constraint, it makes sense to solve for r squared because it's already just that. So very occasionally, it does make sense to solve for r squared instead of for h, but most of the time it makes sense to solve for h. So solving for h, we get h equal to 2,000 divided by pi r squared. 
and we're just going to sub that in for h there. So now our surface area equation is going to be 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r times 2,000 over pi r squared. And before I start differentiating this to take to find a critical value, I'm definitely going to simplify. I can cancel a pi, I can cancel an r. So I'm going to rewrite my surface area equation as 2 pi r squared plus 2 times 2,000. Instead of divided by r, I'm going to say times r to the negative first to make it as easy to differentiate as I can make it. All right, now we need to differentiate it. So I guess if you want, you can say this is a function of r. Now the derivative is going to be 4 pi r minus 4,000 times r to the negative second. And I want that to equal zero. All right, there's a couple ways we can go here. I'm gonna rewrite this as four pi r minus 4,000 over r squared for the zero. And then I'm gonna get a common denominator. Do I really want a common denominator? Yeah, I really do. I'm gonna get four pi r cubed minus 4,000 all over r squared. We don't want r equal to zero, right? That doesn't make sense. So it's really important in these kind of problems and optimization problems, to think about what kind of answers make sense. The radius of this thing being zero doesn't make sense. It's not gonna hold two readers. So really r equals zero is not even, a, it's, it's, a, it's another pseudo critical value because it's not in the domain of the original function. If you look back at this original function here, r can't be zero. What's zero to the negative first power? Undefined. So, Always running out of room here. It is better than writing too small, though. I hope you all agree. So we are going to set just the top equal to zero. And the numbers are not going to be pretty. We're going to get 4 pi r cubed equal to 4,000. Dividing by 4 pi, we're going to get r cubed equal to 1,000 over pi. And then taking the cube root of both sides, we're going to get r equal to the cube root of a thousand over pi. And if you really wanted to, you could simplify that as 10 over the cube root of pi. Because the cube root of a thousand is 10. Are we done? Of course not. I'm asking that question. The answer is almost always no. So we still need to one check that it actually minimizes the cost. I suppose I probably still need this paper over here. So is this going to minimize surface area? Well, let's find out and see. Again, I don't really want the whole number line. I really just want start at zero, and then I want my one critical value, 10 over the cube root of pi. And I should ask, um, is there a limit to how big the radius could be? Well, I don't think so, right? Because if we want, if the only constraint is that the volume is 2,000, then the radius could be super big, and you could have a very, very short, very, very wide cylinder, or at that point, you more like a huge tray. But still, like that is a pot. It's not what we're going to get, but it is a possibility. So there is actually no limit to how large R can be here. All right. So again, I'm trying to figure out is this giving me a minimum? Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. If someone actually asks you to do this work, but it's obvious that the answer that they're asking, like they're asking you to find a thing, and you're like, well, of course it's going to be a minimum because like that's what they're asking you to do. If I was trying to save time on a test and show my work. Like, oh, I know it's a minimum, so sure, yeah. Definitely a minimum. I totally checked. I did not check at all, right? Obviously, but you can check. So pick something less than 10 over the cube root of pi. I don't know what that is, but I know that one is definitely less than. Because cube root of pi is, I don't know, less than three, probably less than two. 
but 10 over two is certainly five, 10 over three is certainly three-ish. Less than that is one. Okay, I'm safe with a one. So I plug in one to my derivative. Is it negative? I think it's negative. Four pi minus 4,000? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's negative. Over one, still negative. So it is definitely negative there. And you pick something larger than 10 over the cube root of pi, like 100, right? Go big. You are not limited by how big you can go here. You plug in 100, 4 pi times 100 cubed is way bigger than 4,000. So that top part's definitely positive, the bottom part's definitely positive, and it's definitely positive over here. So yes, it definitely does minimize the cost or minimize the surface area. And then lastly, we still have to find the height because they asked us for both dimensions. So whenever they're asking for you for the dimensions, plural, you almost always have to go back at the end and be like, oh yeah, what's the other secondary dimension? So the height, well, the nice thing about that is we've usually solved for it. So we have up here, the height is 2,000 over pi r squared. So it's going to be 2,000 divided by pi times the radius squared. And if you're short on time, I would leave it like that. If you're not short on time, I would leave write it as 2,000 over pi times 100 over pi to the 2 thirds power. And then 2,000 divided by 100 ends up being 20. And pi over pi to the two-thirds is pi to the one-third. So interestingly, this ends up being twice what the radius was. So it's kind of neat that the cylinder that minimizes the amount of surface area has the same height as diameter. Now, if you look at cans in the store, a lot of the smaller cans are kind of much higher than they are wide. If you look like the big cans of beans, they're pretty much approximately the same height as width. They really are minimizing the amount of material they're using by making a can that is as wide as it is tall, or it has a diameter that's the same as its height. So it act, in actuality, this is something that is really being done. It's not just made up for the sake of seeing some math stuff. Cool. Yeah, we got time for, for another. Somewhat complicated one here. Where'd you go? Not so much complicated in execution, just that the numbers are kind of gross. So, yeah. Let's look at this next one. I think this problem is similar to if you're in guys' class with a homework problem about like birds flying over water and land. I think this problem is similar in setup, but definitely not the same. An injured person. Me, I hurt myself in a rowboat. No, not me, I would not be in a rowboat. Needs to get to the hospital as quickly as possible. I will say it's James. I can row at an astounding two miles per hour. I mean, what can I say? I'm injured. And run, this seems unrealistic if you're injured at four miles per hour. Oh, that's probably not so unrealistic. Oh, not sure. To which point P on the shore should we row to, I'm gonna draw a picture in a second, to minimize, minimize, yeah. How much time it takes to get to the hospital? And here's the setup. Here's the shore. Here's the hospital. Here's us in our boat. And we are exactly one mile from the shore this way. And the hospital is exactly four miles from that point right there. And the question is, where should we row to to minimize how long it's going to take? OK. 
Okay, so instead of some equations, right? We're, so we should actually first think about like, what are we trying to calculate? We're trying to minimize time. All right, well, time. I know that distance equals rate times time. And if I want time, I'm gonna say that time is distance divided by rate. So use the same letters. So there's gonna be two times I'm gonna find. I'm gonna find the time it takes to row and the time it takes to run. So the time I'm actually trying to calculate is going to be the row time plus the runtime. All right, so the row time is gonna be the row distance over the row rate. So how far am I rowing? Ugh, I don't actually know, but that's what I'm trying to figure out. So I need to introduce some variables. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call this length here X, and then we can find that length there in terms of X. We could call this X, but it's gonna make it nicer if we choose this to be X here. Um, that length there is gonna be the square root of X squared plus one. Pythagorean theorem. So the row time is gonna be the row distance divided by the row rate, which is going to be, well, the rate we, the rate we row at is two miles per hour. The run time is going to be the run distance. Oh, what's the run distance? Well, if that's X and the total there is four miles, it's going to be four minus X. So the run time is going to be the run distance divided by the run rate, which is four miles per hour. Setting this one up, I remember when I first like learned questions like this, I was like, it seems kind of confusing to set this all up. But so you have to remember that distance is rate times time, or time is distance divided by rate, and then add the two times together. So then we can have a function of one variable that we're trying to minimize. And we have that now. Here's our time as a function of x. And we can totally minimize that. I would probably do a little bit of pre-work before I start differentiating. I would probably write this as time as a function of X is one half times X squared plus one to the one half power plus four divided by four is one and X divided by four is one fourth X. That's gonna be much easier to differentiate. Let's do it. So now t prime of x is going to be one half comes down, I get one half times one half times x squared plus one to the negative one half plus zero minus one fourth. And I want that to equal zero. All right. Um, I don't love negative powers. Like they're good for when you differentiate, like it's good to write that way, but then I really prefer to rewrite this. I would really much rather rewrite this as one over four times the square root of x squared plus one minus one fourth equals zero. I feel like I've made an error somewhere. I'm gonna double check something. Oh, I, yeah, you guys let me get away with some serious garbage here. What did I forget to do? Well, let me ask you, I'm asking you a different question before I do that. How did I know I made a mistake? That's a, that's a harder question to answer. I could see at this point, looking at this, and actually I think you all can see this if we look here just real close for a second. What value of X is gonna solve this? What's gonna give you one fourth minus one fourth equal to zero? Yeah, well, one in the denominator, which means X is gonna be zero. The X being zero at least doesn't feel like it's in the spirit of the question. Right, x being zero would mean you row to shore and then you walk the whole four miles. It doesn't feel right, it is not right. It's because I made a mistake when I took the derivative here. I took the derivative of one half times some stuff to the one half power. What did I forget? The chain rule, I forgot to multiply by two x. So there should be a two x on top. And now x equal to zero is definitely not the right answer to this question. 
Okay, so usually it's a good idea. I know it's really tempting. In fact, I really want to like add the one plus over there and cross multiply. It's not a bad thing to do. It's occasionally when you do that, you can lose possible solutions. It's actually not the case here because there's no way this denominator can ever be zero. Squared by zero plus one is always greater than or equal to one. So I actually am going to cross multiply. I'm going to say 2x over 4 times the square root of x squared plus 1 equals 1 fourth. And then I'm going to say it feels kind of silly, but I'm going to say 8x equals 4 times the square root of x squared plus 1. And then divide both sides by 2. And then what can I do? What should I do? Oh, we're running out of time. I should, right, if I'm trying to solve for x, it's definitely square root of so Let me get 4x squared equal to x squared plus 1. So I'm going to get 3x squared equal to 1. So I've got x squared equal to 1 third. x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 third. But looking back at our picture, which I totally just lost. Looking back at our picture, it would not make sense for x to be negative one, one over three because then you'd be back over here. Right? This point right here is kind of x equal to zero. And so definitely x should be a positive number. Now, that's the answer to the question. Right, because they asked to which point P on short should we row to to minimize how much time it takes. So the point is one over root three away from like this point here. There's not a really good way of phrasing it. I guess you could say the point is four minus the square root of one third from the hospital. That's one way you could write it. we should probably verify at the minimum. That's something that I think we should do. Maybe it's just me. We know it should be bigger than zero because it doesn't make sense to be further to the left. Sorry, I'm doing this over here. And the biggest it could be would be four. Mm, yeah. And so here's our critical point at the square root of one third. And there's my derivative. So I pick something bigger than the square root of one third. What's something that's bigger than the square root of one third? It's easy. One. One is definitely bigger than the square root of one third. If I plug in one, I'm going to get two over, wow, okay, one is feeling not so easy. Um, so if I plug in one, I get two over four times the square root of two minus one fourth. Positive or negative? Hmm. I multiply this by root two over two, root two, positive or negative? Well, the denominators are the same and two minus root two is positive. Let's pause over here and I'm picking something over here feels silly. I guess we could pick zero. If you plug, if you pick zero, you get zero over something minus one fourth is gonna be negative. So it's definitely decreasing, decreasing. So it definitely is a minimum. And that minimizes time. And it actually does. So you could go back if you wanted to. I don't think you need to. But if you want to, you could totally calculate how much time it takes if you run straight to shore. Sorry, if you run straight to shore, row straight to shore, and then run over to the hospital. You could also calculate how much time it takes just to go straight to the hospital. And both of those times are longer than how much time it takes here. Actually calculating that's kind of a pain. Um, well, at least the last part here. But I will tell you, just so, in case you want to know, that the time it takes, if you plug in the square root of one third uh, for x, is going to be approximately 1.43 hours. You plug that into this equation here. Whereas if you row straight there, 
it's going to be about 2.1 hours. And if you walk and then row, walking in the row is actually the easiest to calculate because it takes two hours to row a mile, or sorry, a half an hour to row a mile. And then it's going to take exactly one hour to go the four miles. But this is still better by a little bit. 